This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 672, recorded on October 14th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. We have um, 70 degrees here now, right now, which and clear blue skies, which is nice. Headed for 93, and if I look at the like two week forecast, which of course is all lies towards the end, nevertheless, <laughs> I don't see any other 90 degrees. So we have another glimpse of real fall. Wow. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 54 Fahrenheit, which is 14 Celsius. It's a uh, gray sky, but um, it's not gloomy gray. It's just a little bit gray. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so 15 Celsius and very sunny here. It is. I just went upstairs and looked out. It's beautiful. Which it really is nice. Compared to yesterday, it was all gloom, right? Mm-hmm. Gloom and rain. It's been rain. pretty rainy and gloomy for a while. Uh, we have two guests today uh, from different parts of the country. First, uh, from the University of Michigan. Wow, look at that, Kathy. How about that? Mm -hmm. uh, Ari Kozik, welcome to TWIV. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And you look like you're in the woods, but uh, you're actually in Ann Arbor, right? Yes, which is also <laughs> like the woods. So. <laughs> and from Carnegie Mellon University, Kishana Taylor, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually uh, in Teaneck, so the weather is pretty similar to Brianne right now, so 61 degrees. Three in New Jersey. Look at that. I think we rule. New Jersey is ruling today. <laughs> Yay. Always and forever. <laughs> so um, uh, Kishana and uh, Ari have been involved in organization of black and microbiology, and we thought we'd have them on to talk all about that. And um, also we'll talk a little bit about them as well. So let's start. Oh, and by the way, you guys were featured in the New York Times, right? With Kismikia, who was on TWIV last week. I don't know if you caught that, but um, that was a great episode. Um, a lot of people wrote in and said they loved it. And they said, we asked all the right questions, which is nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yes, great New York Times article. I guess you guys really uh, like that, right? Yeah, that was a uh, that was pretty cool to be featured in the New York Times, especially for me um, growing up in New Jersey. The New York Times is like our flagship newspaper, right? So um, a bunch of folks from my hometown sent me really exclamation point emails saying, "Oh my gosh, we opened a newspaper today and you were in it." So that was really cool. <laughs> that was great. Did they have you send them photos, or did did they take those, or what? No, they sent photographers out. Wow. I know. Um, I I had a photographer, and they sent Ari a whole team, right? Yeah, well, it was it was her and she had an assistant, but it was very like they emailed me on Tuesday and they were here on Thursday. So it was a real it was <laughs> a really crazy experience. Yeah, they're all really nice photos of everybody. Uh, very well done. Yeah, it's not the thing you could do over Zoom. That's for sure. <laughs> they're much <laughs> right. better than that. So you two are part of the team that started Black in Microbiology, correct? So Yes. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what it does and, and what was the, when did it start? When did you have this idea to do that? Sure. So um, I think it was after the incident in Central Park with um, the black birder um, and the woman with her dog. And she had like phoned in a call to the police saying that he was harassing her, even though the video evidence showed otherwise. Um, and so there was a there was a response to that within um, science Twitter where they had Black Birders Week. And so that kind of started off, right, this movement mm -hmm. of um, black scientists kind of showing off their science and talking about um, 
what their experiences are as black scientists in um, both academia, but also the industry and things like that. Um, and then following that, then we had the, um, the George Floyd protests um, and more um, prominence of Black Lives Matter protests and, and those sorts of things. And so um, following Black Birders Week, there was Black Botanist Week and then Black Enduro um, among a, a host of other um, Black in weeks. And so I was looking at those and going, well, it would be really cool, right, to see um, a Black in Virologist Week. But, you know, prior to the last couple of years, I didn't actually know any other Black virologists. And so I was like, I don't know if we have the numbers for this to, like, actually be a thing. And so I was like, but I do know that we have more, like, Black microbiologists under the bigger umbrella, yeah. right, of, like, bacteriology, virology, parasitology, mycology. And so I was like, so if we get us all together, I think this could be really, really cool. Um, and so... Ari and I are in um, a couple of like academic group chats type things. So I emailed her and I said, Hey, do you want to know this? Because I can't put in this by myself. <laughs> and she was like, absolutely. And so then we put out the call um, and that's kind of how we got it started. Um, but we were mostly really interested in um, highlighting black scientists because oftentimes there's always a couple of us or sometimes even just one of us in our different departments, but we know that we exist in the greater world. And so we wanted to be able to show people that were there, but also then like connect each other um, so that we know who the other people are, right? Because um, again, before like two years ago, I didn't know any other black virologists. And so um, now I have a whole network of black virologists, which is really cool. So this is cool. This is uh, uh, about connection among other things. Have you two ever had uh, real FaceTime together? No, <laughs> not in person, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you know each other uh, through these organizations and through social media. What mm -hmm. is there a preferred platform for your organization or your communication? Um, we did most of our organizing through Slack. Um, mm -hmm. And then most of our advertising was through Twitter. But we also, um, which is, the I guess, the platform that I understand the most, which is probably why it's biased towards that. Um, we had some wonderful other um, organizers who did Instagram, but Instagram doesn't make sense to me. So I had to put someone else in charge of that. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one of the things that I really appreciated um, during Black and Microbiology Week was the roll call that was happening um, on different days um, where uh, people could meet um, different uh virologists or bacteriologists or what have you um, on different days um, who are black. And I can imagine people who are putting together seminar lists. Um, I certainly hope we're looking at the, those roll calls really well. How did you kind of decide who was going to be a part of that? Was that anyone who wanted to or was there a, a decision? Process? So, yeah, but as part of the, um, the, the roll call has been the thing that's been consistent across all of the black and whatever the discipline weeks are, the first day there's always a, a roll call. So that's just kind of like a call out for not only the organizers to make themselves known, but just everyone else who's just out there in the world who's been um, roped in by the hashtag to hopefully like say, hey, like here I am, this is where I am, this is what I do, this is what I'm interested in. And so that had been really inspiring for me to see in all of the other disciplines, um, especially I think neuroscience was the one um, that I was the most, I watched the most prior to Black and Micro Week. And there were just so many um, people from all over the world. And I just thought that was really amazing. So um, we, of course, had to do one for ours as well. So it's one of my, my favorite parts of the whole movement is the roll call day. Yeah. yeah. And then, so I guess the roll call, we kind of just followed the schedule, but we thought that it made the most sense to have each sub-discipline within microbiology have their own day, right? And so um, we kind of did like the, the major roll call on Monday, which was the first day. So where everybody could kind of chime in, but then we let um, the different subdisciplines highlight specifically their research and the people who work within those research fields on their individual days so that everyone could shine. Um, and this is partially biased because I knew that there had to specifically be a virology day as part of my um, hashtag viral agenda. And so to be fair, I had to let all the other days have one too. <laughs> so uh, pardon my naivete, but exactly how does a roll call work? Yeah. So on Twitter, essentially you use the, like, so for ours, the hashtag was um, black and micro or BIM roll call. Um, and you basically say, um, my name is, right. So for me, I would say my name is Kishana and I am a virologist who is interested in the evolution of viruses, um, vector borne diseases, those sorts of things. And then also, like you say, your university. So I'm at Carnegie Mellon. So um, 
that, those are so basically just like a an introduction in a hundred and sixty characters. Hmm. So that's an uh, that's an incredible resource. Is that all archived somewhere? Yes. If Excellent. you go on Twitter and search the hashtag, it should pop up. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and so now. Uh, you no longer doubt that there are other black virologists, right? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so what would you say, how many uh, microbiologists, or black microbiologists from your uh, roll calls, what would you say? Um, ooh, from the roll calls? I yeah. don't know. I know that we did also, in companion with the roll calls, we did start a Twitter list, mm-hmm. um, which is where we could just add people who, I mean, this also self-selects for who's on Twitter and who's... <laughs> Yes. And doesn't include yes. people who are not on Twitter. But on that list, I think we're at over 100 um, black microbiologists right now. Um, I It would be interesting to see once we get into our our data, um, how many individual roll call participants there were. Do you plan to sort of do an analysis of those data? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> we um, are hoping to do an analysis and then um, hopefully publish right on um, hmm. kind of how we went about it and what the results were and... Um, how successful it was and if people wanted to emulate or um, do something similar, these are the ways that we went about it that we found were successful. So, I suspect yeah. that ASM would be open to that kind of publication. So that yes. would be great. Yeah. Yep. Sure. <laughs> sure. I, as you say, uh, Ari, I think a lot of people are probably not on Twitter, unfortunately. Uh, I tend, As people get older, they tend to not be, or at least if you look at the age demographics, right? The older, the less likely. There are always exceptions, of course, but um, at least it's a start. I mean, we, for example, would definitely look at that list to get uh, future guests on all the podcasts, right? Well, the microbiology-related ones. Um, so that's great. Uh, and that that week, there were a series of talks, right, on each day, because I know that Kizmi- yes. Kizmikia was on Tuesday for the virology talk. And so that's a great mm-hmm. resource as well. Did you have you have a sense for how many people were listening in on those? Yeah. So um, the cool thing about Black and Micro Week is that we had, um, I think, over 3,500 people register um, for our events. And we had representation from every continent except for Antarctica. Um, so we really had a global audience, which is really cool. Um, but because of that, though, there are time zones that mm. <laughs> kind of like pose a challenge. So I'm really glad that we decided to live stream because and then also record. So the videos are available on YouTube right now. And I think at my last check, we've had over 3000 views um, of mm-hmm. those videos on YouTube, even after the fact, um, which has been great. And I've gotten lots of emails from people, I mean, in the UK or in various countries in Africa. that have been like, hey, thanks for putting putting the content up online, like I've been able to do sh- to, to watch it or like show it to my class or, you know, um, watch it with my family. So it's been um, really great to be having that long, long longevity of impact and wide viewership. Yeah. yeah well, we want to get the link to that yep. um, we'll channel so that we can post it in the TWIV uh, show notes online. Yeah. Yep, no problem. Then we'll get so you. So what was the format? Uh and it was a whole week of activities, right? Yes. So yeah. well, there, the format was we did all panels. So between four and five um, panelists per panel every day um, at 6 p.m. And then occasionally there were additional events at other points in time. So on Monday, we had a keynote by Dr. Baronda Montgomery that happened around four o'clock, which is also available on the YouTube channel. And that was really, really great. So good. Um, and then uh, on Virology Day, we had like a Q and a panel, which was different from um, like our standard, like primetime panel, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, as well as there was also like an interview with someone who um, researches HIV within the queer community or the LGBTQ community. Um, then there was like, um, like a career day panel um, as well as in like the individual uh, subdisciplines had their own panels where they talked about their research and then also issues that affect, right. Um, Black people within those subdisciplines, mm. either via research or via being a black researcher. And you and your committee organized this, right? Yes. Sounds, so, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Well, 
there's no way that me and Ari could have done it our, by ourselves. Um, we had um, to several other lead organizers. So um, Chelsea Spriggs and Anisha Scott um, and Linnell Williams. Yes. Yeah, um, who (laughs) were our um, lead organizers. And so they each had their individual teams and um, they would kind of work within their teams to to get the scheduling up or um, organize our sponsorships Mm -hmm. and fundraising materials um, or public relations materials. And then we had meetings with the lead organizers every week to then kind of like follow up with that and keep everything going. So it was definitely, I think overall, we had about 30. 30 other organizers help us plan this so yeah i think we also have some uh, of the organizers coming on to twim which is tomorrow mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and i think also twip parasitism yep. if i'm not mistaken um yep. as well and you said there was black in neuroscience is that right yes so that was a separate yeah. It was separate from Black and Microbiology, yeah. but Black and Neuroscience happened in August, I believe. Oh, if you have their uh, organizers' contacts, I'd love to get it because we have a neuroscience uh, podcast as well. And I think oh. Black and Immunology is happening yep. soon. Yeah, we're yeah. in contact with them. Oh, okay, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think they're going to be on in a week or two, right, Brianne? Yes. Yeah. But I must say that. We don't want this to be a one-off thing, and I'm sure you don't want it to be a one-off thing. We want to keep bringing uh, the community onto the shows and showcase your science, right? That's the whole point, not to have yeah. it endure, right? Yeah. So what kind of kind of, of results or outcomes or sort of things have you seen happening since Black and Microbiology Week? Yeah, so there's been a there's been a lot. So we've actually been contacted multiple times by people who are looking um, for people to talk to their classrooms um, or um, people who like want to make their job searches more diverse. So so they're having us like post up their their job recs. Um, a lot of pr- assistant professor positions have been advertised through us and they're posted on our website um, as well as other jobs. Um, Ari, do you want to talk about some of the other stuff that's happening? Yeah, so we also are um, kind of in in conversations with some of the larger scientific organizations to um, think about how we can have a presence at scientific meetings whenever we can do that in person again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, kind of having a place where where the other um, folks can we can network and like meet each other in person. Um, it's also been really impactful to hear from the microbiologists themselves about like finding like now friends and colleagues that they didn't know um they they didn't know were out there um so that's been um really gratifying both personally and professionally to be able to make new Mm. connections from from all over and we've also gotten a number of emails from um um professors or um, people who had a career in research um, maybe a long time ago when these kinds of conversations weren't happening. I've had a number of emails um, that have expressed their um, support for seeing these kinds of movements happen and how they um, kind of wish that they that this was something that they had access to. And so they've um, really encouraged us to keep um, keep working at this and keep organizing to um, make science more inclusive so that's been great also as you know it uh, i've been retired for a while here but it reminds me of you know when we would do recruiting and etc both for uh both for graduate school or uh, i didn't deal much with undergraduates or medical school or faculty or whatever level you know we always had an eye on diversity but uh, we'd say, uh, and there were offices of diversity in the university and et cetera. And we'd say, yeah, this is something we want to do. Uh, <laughs> now what? Okay. And this is a resource. This is mm-hmm. great. Okay. Because uh, this is one of a growing number of uh, resources, places where people can go. Uh, people are coming up out of the woodwork, it seems to me. And um uh, uh, it, uh, it's a great resource. I love it. Yeah. And so, 
Oh, go ahead. All right. I was going to say, moving forward, this is those are one of some of the things that we're trying to do, right? So, Black and Microbiology Week was a really great event, and it's probably something that we'll do again next year. But um, we are hoping to become like a broader organization so that we can provide right the the, the names um, and the potential people for different recruitment projects um, and be considered a resource for those sorts of things over time, right? And so. Um, as Ari was saying, we're also working with like larger scientific organizations to have a presence at meetings and those sorts of things. And so um, basically all of that is to say that we we have seen how important this is and we have seen how people have been looking for these types of resources. And so we know that we have a niche to fill. Um, and so moving forward, that's exactly what we are going to aim to do. And something we've heard from our membership also is that they need and are looking for like they need advice on like how to apply for funding. They need people to like um, kind of like critique their work and like work on writing. And how do you find people to launch collaborations and like do this interdisciplinary work that we know um, is important. People need to find mentors and um, both for grad mentors and postdoc mentors and also like for positions both in and out of um, the academy. So we're hoping to be able to be a like central like hub for, for that to kind of connect the people with the companies and the agencies and the institutions um, and not sure exactly how that's going to look yet, but we're <laughs> excited about um, planning for, for that, those kinds of activities. Yeah, you, you uh, will soon find probably that uh, you won't have the time to put in what you need, right? And you, you probably, I should not give you advice, but I will, of course. Um, you should probably make an, a real nonprofit organization, and I'm sure you can raise money and hire people to do a lot of the work that needs to be done, right? Yep, that is oh, the yes. main part of the plan moving yes. forward. Good. Absolutely. Good. I know, I know from experience, I try and do a lot myself, and it just, <laughs> it's very hard. But your goal is far more. Uh, ambitious and I would even say more important. So you, you ought to, I think you have no problem raising money and make a 5013C and hire people to do that because it shouldn't, yeah, it should not just be a week of uh, talks every year. As you say, you're a resource. Yeah. And I think, I would think that, you know, uh, Kishana, you said, you know, I didn't know any black virologists. And I would think just learning who's out there and connecting that one time is so empowering, right? Because now you know it you is. have colleagues out there that you can go to, and that's that's the first step. Yeah, colleagues and even senior people, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I, I know Craig, I met Craig Cam Cameron at ASM. We were on um, a panel together in mm -hmm. 2019. All the timelines blur together now. <laughs> um, but so, like, I knew he was a senior researcher, but we, knew we have uh, Ovita Fuller, who is at University of Michigan now, and it's just, it's nice to know and powerful to know that there are people who have actually succeeded, right, in getting the faculty job and getting tenure who have had successful specifically virology careers because a lot of the times when I look for like older mentors it was like well yeah we're in micro but like I'm a anti like I do antibacterial resistance which is cool but like if I need help writing a grant I need someone who's going to like maybe know the ins and outs of like specifically virology so for me it's been really encouraging um and now I have like this network of people who I can and go to as I try to also right walk in their footsteps and become a tenure track or tenure mm -hmm. faculty member at some point in the future <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that it's a slow process where now you can become faculty and then you can inspire younger people. You can say, look, you can do this, right? And mm -hmm. then it builds momentum, right? And that's what it takes to have a presence that, that you should have for sure. Yeah, and I'd, I'd imagine that um, with the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak um, that we will have lots of um, budding virologists, probably more so than we would have otherwise. And um, considering the, the disparities and in, in who is getting um, COVID-19, I think many of them will be, you know, black or of um, mm -hmm. some other upper, underrepresented minority. Um, and so having the people there to guide them is really important. And so I, I hope to be able to do that. And, you know, um, it's kind of a, a, a lottery. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. But. That's also because so, you guys are doing awesome science. Yeah. So both of you, I really admire your your energy and your motivation. And I'm always, uh, because, well, I'm always curious as to where that comes from. Uh, what what got you into this? Have you been sort of active in this fashion before? Or is this uh, an all of a sudden thing? Tell me that part of your story, both of you. 
or do you want me to go first or do you want to go? <laughs> I can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, I, my, if you were to ask my mother, she would always say like, well, Ari's always doing something. She's always doing something. And if she's been somewhere, um, you're going to know that she's been there when she's gone. So um, <laughs> she, she says that all the time. So um, my grandmother used to call me a busybody. Um, I'm not sure if that was a compliment or not, but um, I have always been really excited about science and medicine from like a really early age. And I think that has, I mean, only grown as I've been able to l- learn more and, and find my, my happy place in science, I guess. But I also have, I mean, recently embraced my love for the promise of the academy, I think, Um, because I think um, universities play such an important role in society. And I think there's just so much good that we can, we can do. And so I'm, I'm really motivated by trying to like push, push as much as I can in my little sphere of influence um, to try to make that happen. Um, So, I mean, I'm involved in way too many things. (laughs) <laughs> at University of Michigan right now. But um, I I just, I really love, like, I love what I do and I love um, collaborative um, science. I love, like, um, talking with colleagues. I love, like, seeing problems, trying to solve the problem. Like, okay, we need to fix this. How can we fix this? And who do I need to talk to about this? Um, that's just, I don't know, that's just, I don't know. I can't not do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and I would say... So family history wise, I come from a line of um, black women who, as I like to call them, are habitual line pushers. Right. And so um, whatever the status quo is at the time, um, a lot of my ancestors have. So my great grandmother um, was the reverend of of her own church in New York City. Right. Back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, which is like totally not a thing that you would have seen back then. Um, And then. Um, one of my one of my aunts is um, a political activist, um, semi well known for her um, head to head combat with Bill Clinton. And so um, I have um, right this history of people who are politically active, who stand up for their people, um, and just like as a personality, I've always con- I've, I've always been c- kind of on the extreme extreme end of extra extrovert. Um, and so I, I love being social. I love connecting people. I love having those connections. Um, and I love building community and, and community is what sustains me. And so, um, to be able to do that in this way, in an area where there's like so much of a gap for me has been really mm-hmm. fulfilling. Um, in addition to, I've always loved science. I, I, though originally I wanted to be a marine biologist. And so this is kind of a ways off from that. Um, but when I got in, when I started doing virology research as an undergrad, I kind of fell in love with it and knew that infectious diseases and um, like ant outbreaks and, and epidemics and those sorts of things was where I was going to be. So to be able to combine those two has actually been really, really great for me. Um, and so I guess maybe what I was meant to do, though, I don't know that I would have seen myself as like someone who was getting involved in activism at a younger age. Hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Both of you strike me as fearless <laughs> and just go do it. Right. I love it. Um, I, I, just, I, I just want to tell you something. I got an email, personal email after Kizmikia's uh, episode. And it's a person who said he was raised in a country where you are, where racism is part of the culture. All right. And he said, after, as he listened to Kizmikia, he said, I felt my racism melting away. He said, she was obviously smart. And, you know, all the things I'd been taught were wrong. So I think that is just a an indicator that you have to get out there and let people see you, right? Because if they don't, they're going to fall back on their ways, which are clearly wrong. And so I thought... You might like that because it, you know, it, it kind of validates what you want to do, show the world yeah, and, about you. And I think that that's really important because um, one of the things that we I, I try to talk about whenever I get the opportunity is that 
I need uh, people. I think we need to realize how much discovery and innovation we have been robbed of because of the exclusion of so many people from education. I mean, my late grandfather was born to sharecroppers in the deep South in Mississippi. He wanted to go to school because it was now no longer legally justifiable for him to be kept out of school. Um, but the people they were working for um, did not want him to be educated. They wanted him to work. And he actually had to leave in the middle of the night and come north mm -hmm. because they there was a mob after him because he refused to stay in the field and wanted and, and showed up at school. And so like education for my family has always been really important. It's something that is um, your right. You have a right to, to learn things and to embrace that curiosity. And so it has been a running thread through many conversations of, of, of my upbringing. And so that's something that my parents in, instilled in me was um, you like as, as, as a people, like we have things to contribute. Like we are curious, like we have, we have so much to offer and there are so many things that we, that we've missed out on. Like how many, I, I mean, how many discoveries do we not have right now? Because the person was not allowed to, to go to school. And even some of the people that we kind of look up to like George Washington Carver, like if you look at his personal story, there are so many times where he tried to go to school and either wasn't admitted or that he had to leave because like they, they didn't allow like black students to be with and, and he was able to accomplish all those things in spite of. So imagine all the things we can accomplish if like all of the, the barriers are, are gone, like what we have so much potential. So we're only at the beginning of that here. So I think that's really, really important. Ari, where are you from originally? <laughs> I am originally from Gary, Indiana, mm -hmm. which is a really small steel town on Lake Michigan, just outside of Chicago. That immediately triggers what, Kathy, do you know the song? Gary, Indiana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from the Music Man, yes. Music yeah. Man, okay. And uh, where did you go to college? I went to Calvin College, which is a private um, liberal arts college in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Were you a science major? I was. I majored in biotechnology. That's actually where my formal education, I went into college thinking I was going to do some clinical psychology, but I took the um, Phage Hunters class through HHMI mm -hmm. that they were offering. And that was that was it after that. <laughs> So um, that's that's a great worse. curriculum. That's a, just a wonderful <laughs> curriculum. Yes, I learned so so much, and it was like I think it was two thousand nine, two thousand ten. So like the Human Microbiome Project was like just starting up and creating a buzz, and next generation sequencing was taking off, and bioinformatics was like just starting to get going. And so it was a really exciting time to like get into microbiology at that time. And so I was all microbiome all day long after that. Hmm. And where that's did, interesting. I thought I came in at an exciting time. Yeah, we all did. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all uh, think that. <laughs> that, that, that. That's that's great. So when did when did science happen to you? Sounds like you went into college already a scientist. Yeah, I mean, I think science happened to me when I learned how to talk. I think um, <laughs> my 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 parents say that I've always been a person who asks questions. So I would follow them around all day. Why is this? Why is that? Okay, but why is this and why is that? And so um, they, they, but, but my mom, she, they really encouraged that in me though. So science fairs were like my favorite part of the school year. And we would go to the science supply store. My mom was a teacher. So, you know, there are school, school to stores for teachers where they have all of the billboards and like experiment th kits and all those things. And so she would take me there and um, figure out what we wanted to do uh, for a project. And so I, was really excited about science from 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 an early age. And where did you uh, do your PhD? At Purdue University. Oh, oh boilers! <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> what types of things did you work on for your PhD? I worked on um, the role of cytokines and the gut microbiome in inflammatory bowel disease um, in mouse models. Um, so really looking at the the relationship between the, mi the microbiome and inflammation and inflammatory processes, which kind of mirrors what I do now working on the airway microbes and asthma because it's another inflammatory um, disease. It's my, my happy place right now. 
Whose lab and what department were you in at Purdue? So at Purdue, I was in the Department of Comparative Pathobiology. They had an interdisciplinary life sciences graduate program there where you can um, have mentors from more than one discipline. So I was in the microbiology training plan, but my mentors were in agronomy and um, comparative pathobiology in the veterinary school. Um, I was in the lab of Dr. Yava Jones-Hall. She is a pathologist. I think now she's at at a university in Texas. And my other co-mentor was Cindy Nakatsu, um, who she's still at Purdue, but she's um, a relatively well-known agronomist there. So that's who I trained under there. Mm -hmm. And so right now you're a postdoc at University of Michigan, right? Correct. And tell whose lab are you in there? I am in Yvonne Huang's lab. Um, she's a pulmonologist um, in the pulmonary and critical care division. Um, she works on asthma and COPD, and so that's uh, where I'm studying the microbiome, uh, mm -hmm. the airway microbiome and asthma. Um, I'm hoping to or planning to um, work in kind of the trans kingdom interaction space, so looking at not just the bacteria, but also the viruses, yay, <laughs> and um, <laughs> the fungi that contribute mm -hmm. to airway inflammation. How long have you been there? This is my... This uh, I've been there for two years. This is my mm. third year. Okay. And do you have any idea what's next for you? Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully the tenure track. I, mm -hmm. I really, I really enjoy, um, I really love what I do. I do m most of my research is like computational right now. And so lab based, I'm working with, I'm doing clinical, clinical work, um, data analysis, bioinformatics is what I like to do. I'm hoping to be able to um, keep doing that and keep collaborating and doing really cool projects, microbiome related. Have you ever seen Kathy walking around campus? <laughs> um, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but not lately. <laughs> like, right, not lately. Not lately, though. Um, so are you in BSRB? MSRB. You're in MSRB. Okay. I'm in MedSide, too. So oh, our so buildings probably. are connected. Yes, but we walk through but, there all the time. Yeah. Well, now you, you'll... Uh, Recognize we'll each seek other each other out for sure. Yeah, yes. Somewhere out there in the future, there's a lunch. Right. Oh, right. for sure. Uh, I just looked up uh, Yava Jones Hall, and she's at uh, Texas A&M. Yes, yes. In the you. Department of Veterinary uh, Pathobiology. Kishana, where are you from? Um, originally from Teaneck, New Jersey, so about 15 <laughs> minutes outside of New York City. <laughs> I know Teaneck. We were talking before that Teaneck in my high school used to play each other in sports. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I played, I played, I played uh, Allendale in soccer. I'm pretty sure in high school. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, where did you go to college? Yeah. So I did um, a bachelor's of science in animal science at the university of Delaware. Um, originally pre veterinary major. So the plan was to go to vet school. Um, and then I ended up changing it to just like general animal science when I decided I did not want to go so that I didn't have to take physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's Delaware is where Alan Dove went, right? Does, does any, uh, yeah. I, think, uh, I thought Maryland. Is it Maryland? Maryland. Yeah. Did, Baltimore. Uh, did Biden Baltimore. go to, did Biden go to University of Delaware? No. Yes. yes. George Biden did go to University of Delaware. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Sorry. So, um, so you mentioned an interest in marine biology, mm -hmm. um, and you've also mentioned being interested in going to vet school. Sort of, mm -hmm. when was the marine biology compared to vet school? Yeah. So my um, my great grandmother used to babysit me a lot, and she used to put Flipper on the television, and so I was obsessed with dolphins, um, and still kind of am. It's not as bad, uh, <laughs> but they're definitely my favorite animal, and so. Um, when you do like cursory research as like a middle schooler who has like no experience in science and no one else who's been in science in your field, right. They say dolphins are marine mammals. So you should do marine biology. So um, I actually went to the university of Tampa for a year to study marine biology and then um, was hit with the reality that marine biology includes um, oceanography um, and botany and some other things that were like kind of interesting, but like not really my thing. I really just wanted to be with the dolphins. Um, and so I changed my plan from marine biologist to marine mammal veterinarian. Um, and so ended up transferring to the University of Delaware um, where they have a, the um, University of Tampa didn't have a pre-vet major. They just have like a general bio. And I was 
um, very intent on going to vet school. So I was like, no, I want the best like pre-vet education that I can find. I'm going to Delaware and it's closer to home, which originally I was just trying to get out of New Jersey and didn't want to be anywhere near New Jersey. And <laughs> then I changed my mind because I was kind of homesick. Um, <laughs> and then um, once I got there, I was encouraged um, in order to make myself attractive to veterinary schools because they're so competitive, more competitive than medical school um, to do research. And so my academic advisor at the time was doing avian virology research. And so that's how I kind of got, it was very um, applied avian virology research. So um, whether or not certain um, disinfectants can inactivate avian influenza or Newcastle's disease virus, those sorts of things, if there was a poultry outbreak, um, because I'm not sure if you all know this, but Delaware, Maryland, Virginia Peninsula has the largest number of chickens in the country. And so that's mm. a really important part of their economy. Um, and so we were getting this funding to do this research. Um, and so I wasn't really fond of chickens, but the virology part was really cool. Um, and as part of the curriculum, they had a um, like a zoonotic emerging infectious disease class. Um, and in the class, we covered the hantavirus outbreak that happened in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was hooked. I was like, I get to wear a spacesuit. It's really dangerous. It's really cool <laughs> to do these like real, these like really cool viruses. I'm I'm done. I want to do um, epidemiology. Like I want to do outbreaks. Um, and so from there, I went to George Washington University and did a master's of public health microbiology and emerging infectious disease, which is a split program, half epi, half microbiology. Um, that sounds like a really interesting program. Yeah. It was it was really good. Um, and actually, most of the micro department there uh, were parasitologists. And so I actually got a really good introduction into parasitology that I don't think I would have gotten otherwise. And so I um, happened to have favorite parasites that I don't know that I would have if they didn't if I didn't take those programs. So crypto and Giardia are my two favorite parasites. Um, <laughs> I, I don't I don't have a favorite parasite. I got to get with the program here. <laughs> and, then, and then if I had a third one, it would be trypanosomes because their antigen, <laughs> their antigen switching is like really interesting to me. Um, but so while I was uh, while I was at George Washington, I did a ma um, my master's thesis was on antibiotic resistance um, in E. coli on chicken farms in the Delmarva Peninsula. So apparently, I can't get away from the chickens. Um, <laughs> but, um, so after doing that, I was said to myself, you know, um, bacteria is okay, but I definitely really like viruses more than I like bacteria. Um, and epi is cool, but it's a lot of sitting at your desk and doing calculations and I missed the lab. Um, and I was also doing an internship at the FDA at the time. And my, my, um, internship advisor had said to me, you know, if you want to do research, like run a research lab, you have to have a PhD. So I wasn't originally planning on getting a PhD. I felt like that was too much school. Um, and I wanted to like work and have a job and make money and be an adult. Um, and he was like, I think you should go get your PhD now because if you start working, you're not going to want to go back. And if you, if you want to write grants and run your research program, that's what you need to do. Um, and so I applied for PhD programs and got into the interdisciplinary biomedical science program at UGA um, and ended up doing my PhD project on epizootic hemorrhagic disease virus, um, which is a vector-borne virus that infects mostly deer and other ruminants, so like cows, um, those sorts of things. And um, vector-borne disease is kind of where I, I found myself moving after learning about neglected tropical diseases in my master's program. So I knew that that's what I wanted to do for sure. Um, and so that's what I did. And now you're you're a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. What are you working on? Whose lab and what are you doing there? Yeah, so um, I am in Dr. Elizabeth Wayne's lab um, in the she's she's split between chemical engineering and biomedical engineering. So she um, her research usually in, involves drug delivery within um, macrophages for different diseases, and um, we wrote a grant together to look at the role of macrophages in SARS coronavirus two pathology, so COVID-19, um, and seeing, right, because we feel like, or at least at the time when we wrote the grant, the literature was focusing on um, adaptive immunity as it should in terms of like getting a vaccine and all that stuff. And so um, we were seeing these health disparities in folks with just with diabetes, um, heart disease, those sorts of things. And so um, diabetics all, um, have dysregulated macrophages. Um, and so we were wondering if um, the dysregulation of those macrophages is maybe contributing to the more se severe, um, the more severe COVID symptoms, and so that's what we're we're working on now. 
And what uh, what is in your future? Yeah, also like Ari, I would love to um, do tenure track. I think academic science um, has been the most appealing to me because of the, the freedom to choose your own research, to be able to write the grants to then fund the research that you want to do. Um, I don't think I, so my previous postdoc was in influenza um, evolution and reassortment. And so I don't think that I want to, I, well, I know I, respiratory diseases are cool. Um, but my first love is vector borne diseases. And so if I were to um, get a faculty job, I would be doing um, emergence and evolution of vector borne viruses. So, uh, so the flu uh, research was that uh, at Davis? Yeah, that was at UC Davis with um, okay. Sam Diaz and Yunos. And how long were you there? For two years. I just left in August. Okay. So this is my, this I'm like in my third year as a postdoc. I also want to point out that uh, Kishana is our second ever counselor for virology trainees at the American Society for Virology. So uh, we have counselors in various disciplines of virology and uh, they're all faculty level. And we decided that we wanted to have younger representation. And so first it was just going to be a one year uh, position and we realized that it takes a, a year on council before you even figure out how ASV <laughs> is working. So we decided to extend it to two years and then have two counselors and have their terms overlap. So um, Kishana is our second one ever. And so uh, we didn't get to have our meeting in person this year, but I know that uh, Kishana and Caitlin had great plans and we're going to really try and incorporate things going forward. I don't know if you want to talk a little more about that, Kishana. Yeah. Uh, I will also plug and say that if you, if I sound like someone you would want to work with, you should definitely nominate yourself uh, because Caitlin's position is coming to an end in June. And I would love to um, have another partner to work with. It's been really great to have someone who is a little bit more experienced with the council to kind of bounce ideas off of and, and work through. Um, but yeah, so we are um, the postdoc, the counselors for postdoc for counselor for trainees um, right. and we happen to also be a lot of uh, we changed the title <laughs> yeah <laughs> we didn't want to just be for postdocs and and then a lot of people thought at first for caitlin that um I saw something about the title connoted something that wasn't really how it was working and so we struggled with that but yeah counselor yeah. for virology trainees so essentially our goal is to right give voice to trainees i know at least for me before i joined the council um how these larger organizations govern is kind of mysterious. Um, and so now that I want to know how things operate and then have like the foot, my foot in the door to then communicate with other members of the council, I, I hope to be, or we're hoping to be a voice for trainees to kind of uh, be able to address whatever issues that they want the societies to address, um, to have better representation, right. Within the, the organizing of these um, conferences and stuff like that. And so, if you are also a member of ASV and just kind of want to chat about like what we're working on, you can always send me an email too. So, Right. We just opened up the nominations. Um, you can self-nominate. You need to have a letter from your mentor kind of saying it's okay for you to go off and do this extra stuff. Um, and those uh, nominations are due November 13th. So, Well, that's been great. Anything else that uh, anyone wants to, to add before we say goodbye? I just want to say I'm really impressed and I feel like the future is in good hands and I, uh, I appreciate what you do. Thank yeah. you. Thank that, you. That's yeah. Really so and now I'm going to go cry. After <laughs> <laughs> you and can cry uh, right here on Twiv, you know, I think it's been done before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shana, do you want to mention anything about um, some of the things you're doing with teaching as well? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I am, um, an HHMI teaching fellow. So um, Mercy College got a grant from HHMI to um, bring in folks who are interested, postdocs essentially, who are interested in learning about inclusive teaching in the classroom. Um, and so I got a bunch of training on inclusive teaching this summer, which was really great. Um, how to right, be more considerate of your students who might have different backgrounds from you, who might be going through different things from you. Um, and so now I get to be an adjunct at Mercy. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching immunology which has been interesting to have to remember all of the immunology and not just the stuff that's important for viruses. 
um, <laughs> for sure. Um, and so I'm, I'm having a really good time. Brianne has been really great in looking over my syllabus and making sure that I um, know what I'm talking about. And when I feel really insecure that I have no idea what I'm doing, she tells me that it's not that bad. And I'm you, doing you got okay. it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> do you know? Uh, do you know Davida Smith? Yeah, yeah, that sounds really familiar. It's possible that we were in training together at some point this summer. It's a lot harder to remember people though when it's not like face to face. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. (laughs) Yeah, I I've known her for for uh, quite a while, and she's up there and um, went back when we were seeing people. uh, Went up there and participated in a meeting, and she showed me all her teaching labs and virus models. She's got cool virus models everywhere, so. If you have the opportunity, okay. seek her out. Okay. She's she's great. She's really okay. good. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, from the University of Michigan, Ari Kozik, thanks so much for joining us, Ari. Thank you for having me. And great job what you're doing and keep it up, okay? And and uh, we'll be in touch uh, to get more people here on, on TWIV. And Kishana, Kishana Taylor from... Carnegie Mellon. Thank you, Kishana, for joining us. Thank you. And um, as soon as I get my next publication out, I'll send it to you so I can come back and talk about it. You bet. <laughs> you bet. Anytime. Deal. It's Sounds deal. good. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Great work. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they have so much energy. The yes. um, uh, So, uh, uh, you know, I'm clueless how did they wind up on the show oh well they the uh, they emailed me weeks ago okay and i've been they, working way before even the black and micro oh yeah yeah long before week long mm-hmm. before okay. and um i've been conversing with the with you know the the organizers or microbiologists sure. of various sure. sorts so we've been arranging twiv and twim twim tomorrow we have two uh, guests and then twip and then Black and Immune is a separate. They've been working with uh, Steph. So, uh, yeah, they Great. just reached out um, a long time. Right. Actually, this I think. Is the, uh, this is the bright side of social media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The bright side of the internet. And, I, you know, I, have, I've, I was wondering at times during this uh, if there isn't uh, actually a silver lining to the pandemic in all of this, you know, because it's like. Uh, I feel almost like people have, in a way, more room for this sort of interaction. But I don't know. Maybe that's well. Well, if nothing else, since we're all spending so much time on Zoom, yeah, um, it's easier to connect with people who are sort of further away from us. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. I think, well, I think there are there are silver linings, but the cost has been too great. Oh, yeah. Uh, I yeah. I would say if we could just not have had it at all, I would be. Very happy that because would be fine. Uh, too much disruption and death, um, yeah. and it has really been divisive because there are people who believe that it's not an issue and think that two hundred thousand people dying is not, and, and that just is wrong as a human being, as wrong as it can be, and that's not politics, folks. That's science and humanity that I'm talking about. So uh, I would rather have reversed it and. Um, and I don't know, the, the Zoom would have come eventually, but... Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, but, but you're right. given that you didn't get to reverse it, yeah, we it's can better. make what we can of yeah, this Yeah, you now. make... You make uh, what, do you, what is it called? You make, make some... Make lemonade. Make lemonade <laughs> from they lemons? They give you lemons, you make lemonade. Yeah, I suppose so. They but, also reached out to um, ASV and ASM for support for the Black and Microbiology Week. So it got on our radar pretty early, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm very oh, happy. Well that, done. Uh, I've just been uh, sitting here. You guys have all done a great job. Well, I, I, um, I'm glad they reached out to us because uh, it further emphasizes that we're voices here um, in science and communication. And I'm really happy to, to see that. Yeah, I would say that if anybody is on Twitter, um, if you actually just search for the hashtag, um, hashtag black and micro, you'll find all of the posts about their week, all of the roll call information, all of those kinds of things. Um, so uh, you can find a lot of it. You can find the black and neuro stuff from hashtag black and neuro um, and things like that. And they are really fantastic resources. And it's not just for them to reach out to us, but for us who are not black and who haven't had these experiences or uh, people of color experiences 
to make sure that they have a platform or showcase. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's what this has allowed us to do. Yeah. Well, the, after the George, George Floyd incident, right? Um, Black Lives Matter, one of these uh, individuals wrote and said, aren't you going to say something? And that woke me up. And so we had, we made a statement. We had Bob Fully Love on Kismikia last week and and now this, and I think this will be de rigueur going forward, right? I, I think it's important to showcase other people doing science and give them a chance. And we have a platform that can be used for that. And that letter that I talked about is just an example of what we can do, right? I felt my mm -hmm. racism melting away. Yeah, it's just, great. It's just great. Um, all right, what's up with Astro Kate, Rich? Uh, so Kate Rubens, who uh, we had, who is uh, a virologist, uh, I wouldn't say a virologist first, but uh, temporally, uh, she was a virologist before she was an astronaut. Uh, and we interviewed her on a TWIV sometime back at an ASM in uh, New Orleans after her first uh, trip to the International Space Station. And uh, she uh, gets a second run and she blasted off last night with uh, two Russian cosmonauts from Kazakhstan. Uh, I was going to stay up and watch the live broadcast, but there's way, I mean, it was the middle of the night, you know, for, you know, in uh, central time. So I didn't do that. I was kind of hoping uh, somebody put, uh, Vincent or somebody put the link in here, TWIV 444, Astro Kate, the right stuff. So um, uh, at any rate, they blasted off. They've docked with the uh, space station. Uh, she should be on board now. Uh, I was looking for some, I was hoping that NASA TV would uh, uh, post uh, video reruns right away. But uh, as of an hour or so ago, there wasn't anything there. There probably will be. And, and I'll keep an eye out for those and post them. At any rate, I've linked here to, uh, I think this is a space.com article. Uh, but you can just search for uh, Kate Rubin's launch or something like that. And you can get news on that launch and we'll be, uh, watching her as she does her, she's going to be there for six months. So is, is the plan eventually to use our rockets, uh, to get them up there? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, the next mission is the first, uh, non-test, the first real commercial test mission of the SpaceX Dragon, mm. uh, capsule. Okay. And they're going to send up four, uh, astronauts. So they, the, uh, for the first time in a while, the space station will be fully manned. They'll have uh, seven astronauts uh, on the space station. Um, and I presume that uh, Kate and her colleagues will return uh, in the Soyuz that they, uh, that they took up there. Uh, and I presume that, I don't know, but I presume that both SpaceX and uh, the Soyuz program will will continue to ferry astronauts uh, back and forth. But yes, the SpaceX is going to be in business for real just in a few weeks. That uh, that launches pretty soon. I don't know what's happened to the. Uh, there's the other commercial program in the U.S. was uh, with Boeing, and uh, I don't know what its status is at this point. SpaceX is uh, apparently ahead of them. So if any of our uh, newer listeners haven't listened to episode 444 with Astro Kate, um, they absolutely have to. Um, I just remember how much I was in awe as an audience member. Uh, she talked a lot about doing experiments on the space station, um, pipetting and um, doing PCRs and centrifuging and all of those types of things. And I will never forget the fact that she said she had to put in her protocol that she needed to hook her feet on things when she pipetted <laughs> because every action had an uh, equal opposite reaction and she would go backwards <laughs> when she pipetted. It, that has stuck with me ever since. So you yeah. really should listen to you that were, one. I remember. Uh, the, yeah, thing you were. the thing that really stuck to me was when, when we asked her about spacewalking, okay? And we said, you know, I said, wow, that sounds like really fun. And she says, well, that's what we call type two fun, all right? <laughs> type two. Uh, which is when you're actually doing it, it's such a hassle and so intense that it's hard to really have fun. But after it's over, yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> so you were in the audience for that, Brianne, I remember. Yeah, that's where I first met you, right? At that ASM meeting, is that correct? Yeah, um, I think we... we we're in contact a few different times at a few places, but we certainly talked at that ASM, definitely. So the funny thing is that, um, so she was 
doing something else at ASM. And um, they said- He's giving oh, a keynote talk, I think. He's giving a keynote. Sort of well, talk. basically, yeah. Ed Young interviewed her. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, at, right after TWIV. So I'm like, hey, what, what is it? What are we, chop liver? <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so the ASM, Chris Kandayan, who used to, I work with it. And he said, he said, yeah, you can do Kate Rubens now. I said, no, I have a thing then. I can't do it then. And he said, Vincent, we have an astronaut. You're going to do this. I said, okay. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Didn't. Uh, yeah. and, she, and in her virology career, she was a pox virologist. So we yeah. crossed paths at uh, one point or another. That's cool. Anyway, it, uh, I will repost the uh, video so people see it because now we got much more engagement on the YouTube I put up Sam Sternberg's twim about CRISPR Cas, you know, and it's got thousands of views, whereas, you know, nobody would have noticed it two years ago. So I'll, I'll, I'll somehow bump uh, re, re issue because there is a video of her um, at TWIV because we were at ASM and they, they recorded it. Ray Ortega was there. And I'm with you, Brian. I'm just in awe of the whole thing. If I, if I, if I could could do it over again, um, uh, if there's any way I could do it, I would do it. But I'll tell you, it does take the right stuff. You know, she's learned Russian. She flies jets, you know, the whole nine yards. It's amazing. Personally, I, 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 I saw an interview with her just the other day. This was great. Where you could see her speaking and you heard a voice with a Russian accent that was translating mm. and the translation was in English. So it was so odd because you heard she was obviously being interviewed and, and she was speaking Russian being translated into English. Wow. Per personally, I'm in awe of plaque assays. I don't want to go into space. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in awe after 40 years. That's my type two, uh, what, what did you call it? Type two what? Type two fun. That's oh, my that's type, type one fun, Vincent. Come what on. is type yeah, one? Yeah, you stress during the plaque assay? <laughs> yeah. No, I know. That's my relaxation when I used to do that. All right, yeah. Kathy, PSA. Yes, I found out about this this morning. There's something called the Institute of Democracy in Higher Education. It was founded at Tufts University. And they have statistics on science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM students, uh, in 2016, only 43% of them voted compared to 53% of humanities students. And I assume that all these statistics are uh, of eligible voters. So 43% STEM students voted, 53% humanity students voted. And so there's active work now to engage STEM students because evidently in humanities curriculums, there's more... Uh, discourse around uh, voting than there might be in STEM. And so then there's some statistics for 2018, only 45% of graduate students voted in 2018, and only 34% of STEM students voted in 2018. So uh, my thing today is to tell you to register and vote. Wow, it's, a, it's really remarkable that the numbers, right? Yes. Wow. Well, I, you know, I think this is part of a bigger message that uh, needs to come out of all of the turmoil now, which is uh, that scientists need to be more engaged in in uh, current affairs and in what's going on. We can't yeah. just hide in our ivory towers and do our experiments because what we do affects society and what society does affects us. We're part of the whole thing. And uh, the way you, uh, one of the ways, one of the main ways you can uh, have a voice is to vote. So do that. Absolutely. And I would say that people who are more senior um, should encourage the people in their labs to be voting, um, you know, to say, you know, it's OK to miss doing some experiments today. Go make sure that you're voting. We have a departmental policy of you can take hours off to go vote. And, you know, if you need to vote on the actual day and you can here in Michigan, you can register on the day and vote be a lot wiser time wise if you did it ahead of time but uh yeah and and we've made a, a plan for undergraduates and university-wide there's been a push to not have critical live stream things on election day but have things that you can watch uh remotely later uh if necessary for your classes and so forth that's great 
Uh, so in the, in the last few TWIVs, Daniel Griffin's been talking about a COVID-19 testing strategy simulator. He just released it yesterday. He's been working with people in his United Health Group organization to do this. And, and now it is uh, there's a web page. We'll put the link in the show notes to it. And this is pretty cool. You can put in numbers. Um, you can put in numbers about your population, how much your test costs, the sensitivity, the specificity, the processing time, frequency of screening, um, even disease parameters. You can try pooling swabs versus saliva. And then you see the costs uh, with or without confirmatory testing, the cost per day, how many infections you can prevent, and the uh, the reduction in infections, and you can play with it. And I think it's pretty cool. You can you can just spend a lot of time doing this. And Daniel said it just basically shows that frequent cheap testing, <laughs> aka Michael Minna, uh, is the way to go. And they, they and they've, excellent. They also yeah, they've go ahead, backed Kevin. this up with a, a paper that's now uh, on Med Archive, yeah. identifying optimal COVID nineteen testing strategies for schools and businesses, balancing testing frequency, individual test technology, and cost. And so it's the information behind this calculator. Uh, you know, it's testing. funny. Uh, last week. He sent me this manuscript and he said, ah, oh, we're not going to put it on. I don't believe in preprint servers. And then, yes, then they posted it. He said, I guess his, his <laughs> colleagues probably said, Daniel, you have to get this out there. So right. now it's, it's yeah. up. Uh, so, yes, that's cool. Very cool. A couple of other um, things in the news that you may have heard of we will comment on. First, um, First reported by STAT, I understand, Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine study paused due to unexplained illness in a participant. And this is a 60,000-person uh, clinical trial, phase three trial of the their ADNO26 vectored SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And uh, they had an individual, we don't know much about what was happening with this individual, right? I don't know anything about it. Do you, does anybody know anything? No, I don't think no, they released anything. Is the uh, the what I uh, the word I heard was sick. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's about it. Mm -hmm. Very descriptive. Yeah, and so <clears throat> but I'm I'm sure that it's uh, you know there are probably a certain level uh, of illness that triggers a pause. Yes, a pausing rule. The, the DSMB Data Safety and Monitoring Board. Um, looks at the data and they say, oh, here, these are the rules and we've reached this one, so we have to pause. Um, and, and yeah, these these data safety and monitoring boards um, take it seriously. A, a colleague of mine is on one and he said they met for four hours yesterday <laughs> on Zoom to discuss the data in whatever trial they're looking at. So it's good. Now, I mean, this would normally not be in the news, right? These clinical trials happen all the time and these things would be paused and no one would know. But since this is a, a pandemic of huge proportions and these vaccines are key, everybody's on top of it. And, and this isn't necessarily, you know, a really bad thing. This means that the trials and the safety precautions are being followed as they should be. Um, this sort of thing happens sometimes and it means that we're actually doing sort of due diligence yeah, and sure. making sure that this vaccine it's is just, safe. It's just amplified. And they don't have everybody enrolled yet, yeah. but it's going to be 60,000 eventually. Yep. And you can imagine, even if they don't have everybody enrolled and it's 30,000, that 30,000 people, somebody is going to get ill during the course of the early phases of this. It might or might not be related to the vaccine trial. Yep. And that's what they have to figure out. It's good. And so this one is ad 26 and it's the only one that's ad 26, although there are other ads. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. There are other ads. There's Maybe. chip ad no, and there's ad five. And there was a trial we discussed recently uh, that was uh, both ad five and ad 26 in a prime boost protocol. I forget which that was. Yeah. Um, so that's if you're hearing about it, that's what this is about. But it's the normal way things go. There are always uh, things that happen, and this is not unusual. Uh, there's also Actually, been the important the important thing that we can communicate is just that. 
yeah. that this is not unusual. Yeah, I mean, they're going to look at it and say, what's going on? Is this related or not? And if it's not related, then they will resume. Same thing that happened with the uh, chimp adenovirus Oxford uh, vaccine. They did a pause after someone developed transverse myelitis, and they determined that it was independent of the vaccine. So, so is the AstraZeneca trial uh, uh, reinitiated in the U.S.? No, not yet. So these so these it's it's, the, it's it's been reinitiated in the U.K. Right or correct elsewhere, yes. but not yes. in the U.S. Okay, right. And these two are the trials that um, Michigan is involved in recruiting for, but they right. haven't been able to enroll anybody in either one yet from what okay. I can tell. Uh, we, there was also a pause in Lilly's monoclonal antibody therapy trial. And um, remember that several companies have made monoclonal antibodies against the virus. In fact, the paper we'll talk about is Regen about Regeneron's monoclonal antibodies, but Lilly has their own. And they are in, I suppose this is a phase three as well. And uh, they had two participants who got ill, right, after getting the vaccine. So they paused and said, what's going on here? And again, we don't know uh, exactly what happened. This you know, is just why, to make by the, the point way. Here, I'm, sure we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll pin it down later on. Yeah. Uh, here we're talking about a therapy, not a vaccine. Okay. Well, it is so a vaccine. It is a it's, passive it's, yeah, vaccine. Yeah, it's at the... Yes. It's at the crossover. It's a As passive a fact, vaccine. A word that we have not used. Yeah, we did. We, uh, we that, did. A couple of have weeks we ago. We talked about it as passive Versus vaccination. Active. Yeah, yeah. Passive immunization. Okay. For sure. I think so. But yeah, this are, the vaccines can be active in which like the adenovirus vaccine, you're injected, it induces immunity. Or they can give you the products of the immune response. Uh, it's a passive vaccine. We call them vaccines. Right. At least. Although the, and the, the, Great part of the passive vaccine is that it can be pretty fast. The bad part is that you haven't made the immune response yourself. And so you don't have memory cells to make a memory response. And if you were to get infected again, um, then you wouldn't have the ability to make that memory response, whereas a vaccine is giving you a memory response. But this is why we need patients in testing these vaccines. You can't rush them. You have to go through and make sure nothing's nothing is happening, right? You can't say this is going to be ready by a certain date. That's crazy. And I, I think we have reached the point where we're not saying that any longer, but who knows. All right. So speaking of monoclonal antibodies, uh, as we all know, uh, the president was treated with a cocktail. And Daniel Griffin always says, I can't have cocktails at work, but my patients can. <laughs> They're cocktails of <laughs> monoclonal antibodies. Um, and he, he received uh, the cocktail made by Regeneron. And so I thought we could go over the preclinical data, which allowed this to go into people. It's just been, it's been published. And um, this is, they, they have published a number of papers. Uh, by they, I mean Regeneron and uh, collaborators. But this one is the results of uh, animal studies. It's published in Science. And it's Regeneron REGN CoV-2 antibodies prevent and treat SARS-CoV-2 infection in rhesus macaques and hamsters. It's from a group of people at Regeneron and Texas Biomedical Research Institute where I would guess the non-human primate work was done. And um, first author here is uh, Alina Baum, and the corresponding author is Christos Kiratsus, on whose thesis committee I was a member many years ago. Mm, uh, cool. He got his PhD with Saul Silverstein at mm. Columbia, and... Uh, and the, the next to last author is uh, George Yankopoulos, who is a MD PhD uh, at Columbia uh, as well, and who I know. So uh, this, these monoclonal antibodies are quite interesting. So Regeneron uh, has chosen to make them in two ways. So in one way, and this is the kind of traditional way, uh, you, you immunize mice 
Uh, and in this case, they actually use a DNA, a plasmid encoding the spike of SARS-CoV-2, and they put that in. Uh, and the difference is that the mice they use are called velocimmune mice. They're humanized so that the antibodies that come out are human monoclonals. They're not mouse monoclonals, which is good because if you put a mouse monoclonal into people, you make an immune response against the uh, antibodies. And if they're humanized, they don't. So that's pretty clever, these velocimmune mice. Uh, yeah. As an aside, maybe, Brianne, you can fill me in or somebody mm -hmm. as to uh, could you elaborate on humanized? I can. And before before I do that, I will point out, I just did a quick search because the first time I ever learned about the velocimmune mice was on TWIV. Um, and so I just did a quick search for TWIV velocimmune um, and I came up with letters, um, but I didn't actually come up with the episode where we talked about it. But in the letters from 563, um, we have two people who actually gave us um, the links to the uh, production of velocimmune mice and how exactly they work. Um, so um, I see I see three different links here um, about uh, the background of those mice um, in these letters. Um, yeah, you, from, you'd, you'd have to put the human. Uh, you'd have to put the human uh, VDJ uh, genes genes in, right, so that they can then recombine and mutate and become yeah. antibodies. Correct. Ye you put in the human VDJ, but you also have to put in the human constant region. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you have all of the um, parts of the human antibody, all of the genes encoding the human antibody, so that there's nothing foreign. Um, and when that antibody is put into people, there's no or there's much less of an ability to make an immune response against that antibody because no mm. part of it is a mouse antibody. Yep. Um, no yep. part of it is foreign. So but, this is actually an engineered mouse line. This is not like a, a, a marrow transplant or something no. like that. We can breed these mice, yeah. right? They're transgenic. Uh, that is basically. what it looks like, yeah. yeah. Been, Holy they, cow. They've been using these for making various monoclonals. It's very convenient because if you take a mouse awesome. monoclonal and you want to humanize it, you can do that afterwards. But this way you don't have to do that. Uh, I think it's brilliant. Now, the other way they have made their monoclonals is to take B cells from people who have recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infection and cl and clone out uh, B cells that produce antibodies uh, against the virus and then clone the genes out. And uh, there you go. You have your antibody genes. And in both cases, they take the antibody genes and put them in CHO cells in culture in the lab and make antibodies. And... Uh, they have done hundreds. They've lo looked at hundreds of mouse uh, velocimmune antibodies and human antibodies, and they end up with a cocktail of two. And I just want to say that was, every Monday I do a, a, a brief radio show with uh, this radio station. And this Monday he goes, Professor, what are this Chinese ho hamster ovary? What the heck is that all about? <laughs> And when you think about it, you know, if you've never done any science and they say the antibodies were made in Chinese hamster ovary cells, I say, what, what is that? I say, yeah, yeah, it's a common cell line. Uh, it's really funny. Um, so they went in two previous publications, they go through hundreds of antibodies. They look at how potently they neutralize and where they're binding. They've even done some structures of the antibodies bound to the spike. And they end up with using two in this cocktail. That's the cocktail that President Trump got. There are two antibodies. They're called Regen 10933 and Regen 10987. And I looked for about an hour today to try and find out which is come from a velocimmune and which is from humans. And I can't, I can't find the information. And I don't want to spend any more time doing that. But they either came from one or the other or both. And I tried to find Christos's email and I was going to ask him and I couldn't find it. So all the – everything is – conspiring to prevent me from telling you that. Because I thought Kathy would say, what are they from? That's really what's driving me here. <laughs> because you gave us this link and, and <laughs> the um, velocimmune mouse sections, it's still ambiguous. Yeah, we can't tell. <laughs> Either by immunization of velocimmune mice or by isolation from PBMCs of human donors previously yeah. infected with SARS-CoV-2. They don't really tell us. But although Christos in the past has emailed me and, and corrected me, so maybe. But... They were selected because they're they're very potently neutralizing, uh, and they bind different epitopes. And it turns out they both these two uh, monoclonals bind the receptor binding domain of the spike in different places, very strongly inhibit infection. And they picked two 
monoclonals because they thought it would be less likely that the virus could uh, undergo changes that would make them resistant to neutralization with the monoclonals. Instead of having one or two bound to one spot, you'd have two separate. They're not competing with each other, and there's less uh, ability to get resistance. So. 933 and 987, that's the cocktail that's been put in 275 some odd people. President Trump, I guess it would be 276. And then, uh, and this is the preclinical data in this paper, which led them to be able to do uh, the human trials, right? We didn't see this before, but it was, it was there. So in this paper, they ask two important questions. Can you protect animals from infection? That's prophylactic treatment. And can you treat an already established infection? That's therapeutic treatment, right? You can give it the monoclonal before you infect, or you can give it afterwards. And my only my one criticism is that they only look the day after infection. And I, you know, and people, when are you going to get someone a day after infection? Well, maybe, maybe I don't think Trump was treated a day after his infection. I think he was more days into his infection. I think a day after is hard. And remember, these have to be given intravenously, so it's a little higher barrier. So I would like them to have done multiple days after infection, right? And see how many days out can you go and still get some protection. And, you know, we have, I don't know what, Trump is an N of one, so I don't know how many days out he was and whether the monoclonals made any difference because he also got remdesivir, right? So we can't tell anything about that. But that's what I would like to see. All right, it works the day after infection, but what about two, three, four, five days? Because, you know, when people come to the hospital, they typically have uh, shortness of breath and they're days into their infection. So it's not likely that this is going to be so useful. And we know that really already. Anyway, first uh, animal model, rhesus macaques. Um, they give doses of uh, monoclonals, you know, 50 milligrams per kilogram and then they uh, give six animals placebo, and then they, uh, and these are given intravenously into the rhesus macaques, and then they challenge them with 100,000 PFU of virus intranasally and intratracheally three days after giving the monoclonal antibody. And then um, they do nasopharyngeal swabs every day, bronchoalveolar lavage, they put PBS down into the lung and wash, you know, and, and try and sample the virus that's being produced. And then they measure uh, viral RNA by PCR, essentially. Um, and these in these animals, the peak is day two after infection. It goes very quickly, and then it goes, the virus goes down. And they find that the monoclonal treatment accelerates clearance uh, of uh, viral RNA. If you look at the figures, it nicely reduces the viral load. It doesn't eliminate it completely, but uh, both the upper and lower airways, uh, it nicely reduces viral load. And then they tried another one with tenfold higher inoculum, 10 to the sixth PFU. They tried two different doses of um, monoclonal as well. Uh, and uh, again, they see a good clearance of the, of. Uh, virus in these animals. So again, this is pre-treatment. Treatment, remember, two, two monoclonals mixed together. Um, what else? No, okay, so they looked to see if the virus was evolving to be resistance, and they don't see any mutations that would suggest that. So we have two antibodies binding, and maybe that's helping to keep it um, from changing. They also look in the lungs. They see pathology in the placebo monkeys. monkeys. It's far reduced in uh, monkeys pretreated uh, with the monoclonal antibody. Uh, the other model they use is uh, golden hamsters, um, which have been shown. So, to as I understand, as I understand it, the uh, the issue here, one of the reasons for two models. It's nice to have two models anyway, uh, but one of the reasons is that uh, the monkeys don't get real sick. Right. Uh, and so that's a model for a mild infection, uh, the way they put it. The hamsters actually they get sicker, uh, show yeah. symptoms and lose weight and that kind of stuff. So it's a model yeah. a model closer to severe disease. Yeah, the hamsters get weight loss and severe lung pathology. And in the hamsters, they do prophylactic. Wait a minute. Um, 
I must have missed the therapeutic of the non-human primates, yes. Uh, yeah, you kind of skipped over that. But the therapeutic the story, treatment. Uh, one day afterwards, they see, again, reduction in virus loads and reduction in pathology. But again, I would like to see two, three, four. But although I know non-human primates um, are not cheap and you have to consider them carefully. I would say the effect in the therapeutic regimen is not as dramatic as in the prophylactic yeah. uh, regimen. Okay, so, which is, you know, makes perfect sense. They also have, um, you know, in, in all of these cases, it's a pretty high inoculum of virus. It's uh, like 10 yeah. to the fifth, what's that? 100,000 PFU, yeah. black forming units. Yeah, so yeah. that's okay. uh, interesting, 100,000. Of course, that's put right in the, in the nose, right. right in the trachea. So yeah. it's not surprising uh, that that works. Yeah, I've wondered a little bit about the dose of the antibody here. Mm-hmm. Um, so the antibodies are given, uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram, um, and they're given IV correctly. That's correct? right. That's right. Um, and what I was wondering, and part of this is because, um, I had read something about the dosing, um, that president Trump got, um, you know, so 50 milligrams per kilogram, uh, a Reese's macaque is male is like seven, eight kilograms. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's you know, getting into quite a bit of antibody. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how much of the this has to do with volume. You know, is it just that you can't get that much volume subcutaneously? Because I know many of the other antibodies, like the ones that are used for autoimmune diseases, are done subcutaneously. Yeah. But this yeah. this one was and the uh, trial for the this is being done sub Q. But this this uh, paper I did the, is IV. I did the calculations. Right? Sorry. This paper is IV, right? Yes, I, yeah. I think so. So there you don't have a volume consideration, right? You can just... Right, exactly. I just wonder, you know, they, there's been this discussion of Trump getting eight grams of antibody. Um, and I was trying to imagine how you would inject eight grams of any kind of protein um, in any way other than IV. Yeah, Slowly. my understanding actually from <laughs> Daniel is that in, the, in Trump's case, it was IV. Yeah. Uh, though, uh, you know, I think you can do it, uh, sub, uh, sub Q, uh, because that's the way they're doing a trial. Yeah. The trial is, I did the calculation, I did the calculations with Trump's. Okay. Eight grams. Uh, and you have four liters of blood and the typical, uh, now uh, back me up here, Brian, if I get, if I screw this up, Okay. but I looked up to see what the concentration of IgG is in blood ordinarily. And I come out with about 200 micrograms per mil. Okay. Uh, and or is it micrograms per mil or it's not mix per mil? I don't think it's mix okay. per mil. So I'm going to screw this up. But at any rate, uh, if it's micrograms per mil, I came out with, if you give uh, eight mix uh, to somebody with a four liter blood volume, you come out with about uh, 20 micrograms per mil. Okay. So 10% of the total IgG. Uh, would be this thing, which uh, the way I see it is a is a huge dose of a specific antibody. So, so at eight, what the what I came away with is that at eight migs, you're uh, at uh, physiological or super physiological uh, concentrations of a specific antibody. Mm. I, this still brings up a question I wanted to ask earlier about the fact that although these are humanized antibodies. How is it that the humans aren't making any immune response to them? I mean, I thought there's polymorphisms and so forth. So, so man, help us out here. Yes, they are making kind of the fewest immune responses that they could make. There are the least possible differences um, that we could have in any delivered anti uh, antibody. There probably are still some responses. Hmm. Um, so technically this unique um, variable chain of the antibody, the unique VDJ join yeah. could be a um, ant novel antigen. Yeah. And so you could see some um, immune responses um, and at some level there's not, you can't really do much about that. So it's sort of the, the least level of immune responses. So you would um, get some anti-idiotypic antibodies, right? Exactly, anti-idiotypic. Okay. Well, that probably is why they're eventually cleared, right, in part, because they don't last forever. Um, but if you had uh, a mouse, of course, it would be gone even quicker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's partially that's partially why they're cleared, although that's also because they don't have the B cells. 
Yeah. Um, but there can be um, a response where you have antibodies binding to antibodies um, and those big complexes um, leading to some problems like clogging capillaries or clogging yeah. alveoli. Um, so that can happen with antibody treatment, but this makes it the lowest possible risk. So I just did the calculation again, and I looked up. IgG serum concentration is normally, believe it or not, 6 to 16 mg per mil. Mm -hmm. Grams per liter is mg per mil, right? Yeah, that's uh, right. And uh, if you give somebody with a 4-liter uh, blood volume uh, 8 grams, uh, and that, you know, all gets distributed, that's 2 mg per mil. Okay, so you're, you know... Uh, so that's two mg per mil of a specific IgG compared to a total blood volume of 6 to 16 uh, mg per mil. So that's a, a very significant fraction of the total IgG that is specific for this. So that's a, a whopping dose. Yeah. But, and plus it's going into tissues as well as being in the blood, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously it has to go into the mucosa to be able to impact SARS-CoV-2 infection. All right, anyway, the, the rest of the paper is the hamster model, basically the same idea, prophylactic therapeutic treatment. They use more animals. Obviously, you can do more, and they find similar results. They have protection if you give it before uh, of, against both viral load and um, reduction of viral load and protection against pathology. And prophylactically, one day after infection, it will reduce viral loads and pathology. But again, with the hamsters especially, you could do day two after, day three after, day four, and see how far you can go out. But uh, that wasn't done, and I don't know why. If I were doing this, I would have done that because I would like to know how... F I, I suspect, as Rich said, you can't go far after infection and get an effect, but we'd like to see. And so these are the some of the preclinical data that went into the application to put the, these monoclonals in people. And I would assume that sometime down the road, we will get a publication of the clinical trial data. We'll be able to look at that. Yes. Actually, I found uh, uh, th there was a shareholders meeting where they presented the data, and I found a link to the slides so you can look at the data that were presented. They violate every law of PowerPoint, putting way too much text and data on each slide. <laughs> but I guess that's for shareholders. That's what you got to do to impress them <laughs> that we're doing a lot of work. So those are publicly available. You can see exactly what's going on. But yes, we will see a paper with that at some point. Also in this preclinical paper, they point out that they don't see any evidence of antibody-dependent enhancement. So they were specifically looking at that. And that was important for them to be able to go forward, I'm sure. They, one other thing, uh, in the beginning, they talked about the in-life portion of the study and in all life, I could yes. figure was that they meant the in vivo and uh, but no, while they were alive, the in life right? portion. Well, while yeah, they, while they were living, yeah, yeah, it was a weird way to put it. I know. I, I noted that too. I'd not seen that, but I can imagine <laughs> that in a company, that's a aphorism for when they're still alive. Yeah, yeah. You know, a yeah. lot of words we can't use anymore. <laughs> we can't say we sacrifice the animals. You have to say we euthanize them. Yeah. People still do. I know, I know. I get corrected. In my Ayakuk protocols, I'm always corrected because I'm an old guy and I write sacrifice and they say, please substitute. Okay, that's an easy one. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, on TWIV 658, we covered a case of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in a Hong Kong patient. And reinfection is really provable if you have virus isolates from the putative first and second infection, and you sequence their genomes and show that, in fact, they are different isolates. And so they, they're not just the first one persisting for some reason till the second episode. And this one is the first in the U.S. It is a Lancet article, Lancet Infectious Diseases, Genomic Evidence for Reinfection with SARS-CoV-2, a case study. So this is a 25-year-old, and this is interesting, uh, a resident of Nevada who was sick in April, actually went to hospital, was tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, and then eventually became negative. And then later, June, end of May, beginning of June, got sick again, went to hospital, and had both times clinical symptoms. And in fact, it was more serious 
the second time needed oxygen. And sequencing of the genomes show that there are two different isolates, two separate infections. And so this is clearly, in my view, a uh, uh, two infections. They didn't do any measurement of antibodies, which they did in the Hong Kong study, and that would have been interesting. In between infections. So yeah. He mounts an immune response after the second infection, but you don't know between, what his immune yeah. status was between the infections. So what I think is interesting here is that his second infection was symptomatic, whereas in the Hong Kong case, uh, the second infection was not. He had no symptoms. He was just tested uh, upon coming back to Hong Kong from Spain, where I guess they, they automatically test you and they found out he had a different virus. So this is interesting. Of course, these are rare, right? Out of the millions and millions of people infected, this is one, two, three, I think there are four published cases. And But this one he had symptoms, and I don't understand that because, you know, our at least what I think is that – I'm informed by Ralph Barrick is that the, the second and subsequent infections are going to be – asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, but he seemed to be pretty sick. Uh, no, it's possible, of course, that there are many, that, that reinfection is much more uh, frequent sure. than we know because yeah. the second infections are asymptomatic. That's right. But we don't know. Yeah, we don't and know. because the bar to actually prove reinfection is, is pretty high, you have to have sequence from both infections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, do, I do think it's far more uh, frequent than we think especially as we get further and further out from initial infections, months and months, right? Six to 12 months, we're going to see more and more of it. So, um, uh, I always was telling people last spring, well, we'll find out in October because in China, <laughs> because they were ahead of us. And if there's going to be, you know, if it's only going to be short term yeah. immunity or not, you know, non durable, we might start to see reinfections then. We Certainly, have- symptomatic reinfection seems to be a rare occurrence. So well, far. you know, we got four cases and one of the four, I don't know if you can say anything about those numbers. Statistician would rake you over the coals, Rich. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a tough guy. <laughs> uh, but we'll, I haven't heard anything from China, right? We don't get reports of uh, reinfections yet. But, but, you know, overall, the numbers are going up in the U.S. If you look at the curves now, it looks like we're having our third blip, right? Uh, it's going up in many places. We have rises here in the Northeast. Wisconsin is getting hammered. I looked at the map. Uh, it's all red. Even Montana, we have an email where they said we escaped most of it. Now they're getting hit. So I think it's so a my my, uh, uh, my wrap on this, and I'm interested in your comments, is it, it seems to me that to a very large extent, the virus load in a population, the disease load in a population is proportional to the behavior of the population. <laughs> okay. Is that a fair conclusion? I think in part, I think uh, going back to school and not wearing masks is part of it. But I suspect as temperatures drop, humidity drops, uh, that probably is contributing as well. I think the fall and winter is going to be tough. But, but we're not helping for sure. I see people all the time. I mean, at these rallies, these political rallies, people are sitting right next to each other. I don't know. I would never go to one. But if I did, I'd wear a mask. I mean, what are they thinking? And I'd keep my distance. Yeah. yeah I if would, possible. I would too. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to do that. They want you on camera to show the, the crowds. Right? You, wear a, you wear a big hula hoop. But I, I think that... Uh, <laughs> Very good. <hula> hoop. <laughs> um, just one little point back on this reinfection paper in The Lancet. Of the four reinfection cases that are known, they say that the Ecuador one also had more severe symptoms, symptoms with the second yeah. infection. So now the statistics are fifty wow. percent. What's the p value uh, of that? Of <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Tyranny of the p value. Yeah, it's hard to get more of these because, as you say, you have to do sequencing of both uh, isolates, and not everyone has that. All right, um, let's do some email in the remaining fifteen minutes. 15 minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Where did that and go? Picks. We need to have picks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, Robert sent in a, an image of a mall storefront, a sad sign of our times. And Robert's from Rancho Cucamonga, California. So I presume that's where this is. It's a store called COVID-19 Essentials. <laughs> yeah. It's got a picture of the virus on the front. That's good, right? And a, a bunch of mannequin heads with masks on. What yeah. else do you think they sell? Do you think they like hand sanitizer? Hand sanitizer. Hula hoops, right? really big Probably. hula hoops. Hula hoops. 
<laughs> you know, Robert says it's sad, but you know, it's a we're in a capitalist free market society. So however people are going to try and make yeah, money. Yeah, it's interesting. Well. I see, you see news reports of uh, you know, some some businesses that thrive in this. One of them is um I saw a news report on uh, uh, PBS NewsHour the other night about a guy whose business is to uh, uh, re reconfigure vans to live out of, okay, yeah. Yeah. for people to travel and live out of. And his business is absolutely booming because people are, you know, need a place to live because they're being thrown out of their houses, okay, yeah. and they need to be able to move around to get gig work okay so they're all just living in their vans i actually don't think it's a bad thing to have a store selling face masks oh, yeah. right it's great Good i think, idea. I think Good more malls you. that uh do that the better maybe yeah. people... if this makes more people realize that this is a real issue and that they need to be taking precautions and puts it on their radar i'm all for it yep uh rich can you take the next one Rick writes on Twiv six six five. Listener John asked whether. Uh, do you want me to skip down to the? Oh no, that's no. Okay. No. Uh, Listener John asked whether NCBI was demonstrating its sense of humor by including this publication in the PubMed database. Quote: Origin of new emergent coronavirus and Candidia fungal diseases, terrestrial or cosmic. End quote. I remember that discussion. I know several people who work at NCBI, and they do have good senses of humor, but I don't think any of them are amused that this publication found its way into PubMed. As Alan Dove pointed out, PubMed, PubMed automatically imports science publications. It's a computer doing this, not a person. So there is little opportunity for vetting at the NCBI level. Quality control is supposed to happen at the sources the journals and publishers who are mostly peer reviewed. This standard does keep out some questionable material. Note, for example, that the Sasquatch genome published in 2000, the 2013 issue of the journal, in quotes, de novo, did <laughs> not make the PubMed quite cut, nor is the Sasquatch genome in the GenBank <laughs> database. I didn't know that, that had, it'd be interesting to get a hold of that and uh, decode it and see what's in it. Um, so how did the cosmic COVID source publication find its way into Pub PubMed? At first, I thought that Alan had the right idea that the source journal slash book would turn out to be questionable like de novo, but I was surprised to learn that the source here is Advances in Genetics, an Elsevier publication. Elsevier, publisher of Cell, Lancet, Trends in XYZ series, etc. Advances in Genetics is a book series published once or twice a year since 1947, and it purports that its chapters slash articles are peer reviewed, a claim that seems questionable in this case. And he goes on, uh, the cosmic uh, COVID, uh, the cosmic COVID advances in genomics chapter attracted the attention of the staff of uh, Retraction Watch, he gives a link, a service provided by the Center for Scientific Integrity, um, a nonprofit group the Retraction Watch staff contacted the science editor for the AIG edition and asked about the review process for this chapter and received this response. Uh, so this is from the Retraction Watch website, quote, please note author's views are not based on any experimental work or data that needed external peer review or any other form of validation. In this context, I fail to understand how external review by someone else could have altered the decision to share this innovative idea with the genetic genomic scientific community. Contents of the article were internally reviewed between all of us, including me as the serial editor. We did not find it necessary to seek any other view or opinion. Since the article is now available online, all reviews, comments, and reflections would be opened at all to all. So I take it from that, that the editorial hierarchy at, uh, advances in genetics was complicit 
actively complicit mm-hmm. in the publication of this. Yeah. yeah. Here mm-hmm. are a couple of other chapters in this special theme issue, <laughs> list price 145 bucks. Uh, so it's titled, I guess, the efficient, oh, these are other titles, the efficient Lamarckian spread of life in the cosmos <laughs> and the cosmic virosphere, <laughs> virosphere. This does not inspire much confidence in Elsevier, but beyond that, I wonder if it is worth spending any time and effort to think about stuff like this. On the one hand, many people have the same primary affiliation that listener Rob cited, that is common sense, uh, and so can evaluate the publication's merits. But after just a few Google searches, I realized that this AIG edition is already widely disseminated even before its official publication date, and uh, that in many of the citations, it carries the PubMed Association that non-scientists could easily interpret as a stamp of approval. And the Retraction White website lists greater than 30 retracted COVID-related papers. About half of these are preprints, and so you and so you could say the peer review system worked, but the other half were allegedly peer reviewed, so the system failed at some point. Getting all this Uh, Getting all of this miasma back in the bottle is going to be difficult. Thank you, TWIV team, for doing your part and for your efforts to keep us informed and connected in the real world. Rick in Maryland, where it's cloudy with a 50% chance of cosmic viral rain. Well, thank you, Rick, for helping us put that particular bit back in the bottle or near the bottle anyway that was a lot of work tracking that sucker down and uh and i appreciate it this is amazing yeah what are these guys doing yeah making money i guess it seems that uh and i always thought of pubmed as uh peer-reviewed uh-uh but it's not no PubMed that is just cataloging so that's informative it's too bad actually yeah yeah, I mean, and and I don't know. I assume that Advances in Genetics publishes some stuff that's legit. Okay, so you can't <laughs> kick them out altogether. Yeah, yeah, you have to be careful. Well, we we can do our part for viruses. We can't handle cosmic stuff, I guess. <laughs> uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Rachel writes, "Thank you to the Twee team for my favorite podcasts." I'm a research scientist at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. I got my PhD in chemical engineering and I'm now doing research and production in a genome engineering lab. My lab creates gene edited cell and animal models using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. These models are used throughout the hospital to study childhood diseases and develop better treatments for our patients. I have a long commute to work and listen to your Twee podcasts. Listening to your Twee podcasts makes it a much more enjoyable drive. I discovered TWIV around 2010 when I was in grad school and the last few years got into TWIM and Immune as well. I've listened to every episode. I love tuning in because I always feel like I'm listening to my buddies getting together to chat about a cool paper they found. I finally donated to Microbe TV this morning. I've been meaning to do so for so long. Thank you, (laughs) Rachel. I, I can't thank you enough for producing these podcasts. I love listening to scientists talk about science. I love that you're normalizing non-scientists learning about the intricacies and uncertainties of science and the scientific method. And I love that you aren't afraid to say, I don't know the answer. And I thought I knew the answer, but actually I was wrong and here's why. I can only imagine how much time and effort you all devote to producing these amazing podcasts. And I want you to know I appreciate you. Rachel. P.S. Fall has begun in Memphis, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 C, and cloudy today. And though my coworkers and friends are delighted, Vincent, I'm with you, and I'm sad summer is over. P.P.S. I love Alan and Dixon's parable pun. Terrible puns. Keep them coming. <laughs> they have puns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. We uh, this. I know there were no questions in it, but sometimes we need to have a little. Little boost, boost, but yeah. you, and thanks for contributing. Yes, thanks, Rachel. We get boost. Uh, right and there. actually, my reaction is thank you, Vincent. I just come along for the party and I read a few papers and that <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, you do, you do all the heavy lifting, and I really appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love doing this. All right, one more from Brienne. All right, Peter writes. 
Hi there. I'm just a structural <laughs> biologist biochemist at the University of Toronto studying bacterial pathogenesis, mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, and inhibition of novel antimicrobial drug targets. My lab received funding to provide free purified SARS-CoV-2 proteins, which we have distributed to nearly 200 academics and companies in the past six months. We are also working on structure function studies of various SARS-CoV-2 proteins, including N, NSP3, various domains therein, and NSP10 to 14, working closely with the NIAID-funded Center for Structural Genomics of Infectious Diseases. I haven't taken a virology course in my life, nor wasn't too interested in viruses until the pandemic began when I started listening to TWIV religiously. I have since started Vincent's virology course. Thank you so much for this amazing service. Thank you to the Twivers for all that you do. The show is incredible and has really helped me and my lab enter the fray of SARS-CoV-2 research. I have just a couple of comments about the show. First, I wanted to thank Vincent for publicly apologizing in TWIV 665 for his words to Dixon in previous episodes. I too felt Vincent was being too antagonistic to Dixon and it was a very classy, it was a very classy of Vincent to acknowledge this and to apologize publicly. Secondly, I wanted to make a comment about Alan Dove. I appreciate his involvement in TWIV and his comedic relief really adds to the show. However, he has some behaviors that make it very difficult to follow the flow of the conversation between the Twivers. He has a habit of A, interrupting the other Twivers. He does this perhaps 20 times per show. And in one episode, even Vincent commented on this. And B, controlling, directing the flow of conversation by always having a comment, which prevents the other Twivers from directing the conversation, including the host, Vincent. I would respectfully ask Alan to please stop interrupting the others and let them finish their sentences and make their points. I would also respectfully ask Alan to sit back a little bit and don't always control the flow of conversation. Respect the presence of the other Twivers and their desire to direct the conversation in their desired directions. Thank you again, once again for everything that you do and keep up the amazing work, Peter. Um, all right. I am glad Peter appreciates Twiv and I appreciate all of the co-hosts. <laughs> And it's fun that uh, a biochemist, structural biologist is now interested more in viruses. Yes, yeah, sure. That's good. All right, let's... Uh, we do, I, I, yes, I, I just interrupted Vincent. I no do problem. have, uh, you know, it, it's tough to curb our enthusiasm sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, point taken. It's hard on Zoom sometimes you, I mean, we don't have an order that we talk in. We just talk, right? And... um. Yeah, it's hard. I don't know what to do. Sometimes it's, you know, especially if we have a guest, we have five of us that want to ask questions. We're all jumping. I, I don't know what to do about it. But everybody has so many interesting things to say. Yes. I always want to hear what everyone else is going to say just I, as much as I have questions to ask. I mean, I personally try to sit back because I always, especially with a guest, I find, I find that you should let the guest talk the most. But I mm -hmm. understand you have questions as well. But uh, yeah, I appreciate the comments. All right, let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us? I have a book that I am currently reading. Um, this book is uh, by Rita Colwell, um, and it is called uh, A Lab of One's Own. Um, the subtitle um, of this book um, is loading very slowly. And the book is over there, so I can't read it off the book. Um, <laughs> a Lab of One's Own, uh, One Woman's Personal Journey Through Sexism in Science. Um, and so this is uh, a recent book that was just um, published by uh, Rita Colwell, who was a director of the National Science Foundation um, and is a really interesting um, view of her journey in science. Yeah, great Excellent. career. Great career. Good stuff. I didn't know that. It's brand new, right? Because I hadn't heard. Yeah, it's brand new. Nice. Um, I'm about halfway through right now. Very nice. Are you reading the electronic edition or the paper? I am reading the paper edition, actually. So you still like to buy books, eh? I I go back and forth. Uh, it's sort of a question of fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. I read fiction electronically and nonfiction in paper. When I was traveling, I always it was horrible picking out one book to bring, and then you read it, and it's done, and it's huge. Now, and I, I loved being able to get electronic editions, but not traveling anymore. Yeah, a lot of books like this, um, I get in paper because then I can loan them to people afterwards. Yeah. Kathy, what do you have for us? Well, first, I want to show the ear savers that I told you about. Uh, last week. And so um, they're made of uh, plastic. They were printed 
um, on 3D printers by the same people here that made mm. um, uh, face shields. And so basically they have these several different places where you can hook the ear straps. And oh, nice. So Very you go nice. behind your head and then, you know, hook, hook the loops on. And so nice. it, it can save your ears. Where did you get those? Um, they were, they were 3d printed, but watch your mailbox. Yeah. I have a friend who also 3d print, uh, can 3d print them. So if you need more, um, your mailbox can get more. That's also Excellent. good. Thank if you, you if you have a face so, mask that's too tight, you could use that to loosen it up. Right. Yeah, exactly. Nice. So, um, and then my, my real pick is this thing called the endonym map. And it's a world map of country names in their local languages. So when you click on the link, uh, it just tells you about endonyms and you have to scroll down to actually get to the endonyms of the world. And then you can zoom in and hmm. um, see each country in its own language. Hmm. Um, it's just different. It's a quick look and um, I found it kind of fascinating. It's cool. Some of them have more than one word in their name, like Repubblica Italiana. It's not just Italy. Cool. Right. right. Very so, neat. And I learned the word endonym. So that's a good word. It's a twofer. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like something having to do with seeds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Endosperm. Yeah. Rich, what do you have? Actually, I want to preface uh, my pick or preface my uh, run here with uh, a comment that a couple of episodes ago, Vincent, you picked the deconstruction of the girl from Ipanema song. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And I have now listened to that twice and forwarded it to all of my music friends and listened to it the other day with my granddaughter because she's been yeah. instructed by her music teacher to uh, write a song and has been given some chord progressions to work with that that uh film that video is amazing he's really good it's really yeah. really good so i, I we recommend that Do you watch yeah. it kathy I had, I had one of my music friends uh criticize it but Mm -hmm. um, the musicologist liked it and yeah, it, I, I really cool. enjoyed it too. So thanks. I could go on about it for a while, but that's another show. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I found, I have here an article in the uh, New York times by, uh, Carl Zimmer, a science writer who's actually been on TWIV before that, uh, is entitled the coronavirus unveiled. Uh, and it's a nice, you know, sort of rap about coronaviruses, but focusing on imaging of the virus itself and various uh, substructures and intracellular structures using uh, either models or primary scientific data. And he's done a really nice job. Uh, I think mostly of uh, bringing the lay public into some of the primary data and giving people an idea of how structural data uh, what structural data looks like and what the real structures look like and how it uh, can be used. And it's very pretty pictures, very nicely done. All right. Uh, my pick is uh, the fifth edition of Principles of Virology. That is the textbook, fifth edition. I started with the first edition way back when. I got them all here next to me. But you can't see them because they're on my right-hand side. But this, so uh, who are the authors now? The authors are Rawl, Flint, Flint, um, Rack and Yellow, Scalca, Rawl, and Hatsuano. And it's uh, revised, and the e-book is out, uh, and it's a two-volume set, and uh, the, the the paperback, uh, I think, is coming out next month. But I, I would do the e-book. It's cheaper. Um, I, I will be getting 10 copies um, from the publisher. I'll give some of them away here on TWIV. Uh, it will have some kind of contest. We did that years ago at the last edition. It was fun. So stay tuned. But meanwhile- Did you say uh, when the first edition was published? Hold on. For those only listening, he's reaching over now to his bookshelf. So here's the first edition, one volume, uh, Flint, Enquist, Krug, Rack and Yellow, Skalka. So I was asked to join this. It was kind of halfway in production. Uh, let's see, what year was this published? 2000, 20 years ago. So, you know, fundamental to this is a different method for teaching virology, which is by process rather than by virus. Yeah. Uh, which was a revolution at the time. Now, did 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 they 
uh, turn you on to this approach or were you already a pre-convert? Uh, this was their idea, and uh, they got it from from Luria Virology, which was published in the 50s, and that was a process-based book, most, I guess mostly because we didn't know much about individual viruses. But it, it's really – and you can get that book uh, online free as a PDF. It's really, it's really worth reading because it's just written by him and his own views. Quite interesting. But I – they explained it to me. They wanted to do this, and I was fine. Uh, I didn't have a particular bias one way or the other, but I had always taught by virus. But after writing this, I designed my virology course based on it because I thought it was brilliant to do it uh, by process, and I really mm -hmm. endorse it. And a lot of people have told me, oh, Vinny, I can't teach that way. I'm sorry. I have to teach by <laughs> virus. And I said, well, then maybe you shouldn't be teaching because this is the way to do it, <laughs> at least in an introductory course. If you want, you can do advanced courses that focus on viruses. That's great, but you need to know the basics. I mean, what's the point of learning flu and herpes and adeno and polio in separate lectures and you put nothing together, right? So I, right. I And then an, another virus comes along like coronavirus and you didn't have a, a chapter yeah. on that or a lecture right. on that. So, yeah. So, in fact, in, in the fifth edition, you will not find a chapter on coronavirus. There's only one virus that gets its own chapter. Anybody know what that is? Mm. Since I teach using that book, yes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Kathy? It's HIV. Yes, because it's massive. It's, got, it's a whole thing unto itself. And we don't have a chapter on SARS-CoV-2, and people would be disappointed. You know, what, you, what you'll find is scattered throughout chapters, but you should learn the basics and then read about coronavirus in particular. Do you still do appendices on individual Yeah, there are, there are appendices. Yeah. And this edition, we added questions at the end of each chapter, you know, that people can use and so forth. And it's uh, massively updated and um, I like it. I use it for teaching and the figures are great. You can, if you teach, you can use them in your course. They're really cool. Principal, thank you, ASM Press, for doing that. I have to say that when we first published it, nobody wanted to do a color virology text. Everybody said, yeah, we'll do black and white. No. <laughs> so ASM Press <laughs> did it. It costs a lot of money. The art is very expensive. But now, of course, everybody does color. So it's not a problem. Kathy, you've got these picks, uh, listener picks. What are they? Yeah. Uh, so the first one is from Les, who wrote to me. He's an American teaching English in Prague. Uh, he's now an avid listener of TWIV. He found it during the pandemic. Um, he's We've kept him informed and calm, and he appreciates the work we're doing to educate, inform, and debunk the firehose stream of information. So he wanted to share this cool pic, which is from a cafe in Prague. They developed this uh, cake of the virus particle. It, it's not really so much a cake as just this elaborate dessert, um, but it's beautiful. It's become so popular, you have to have reservations so it, for it so that they can ensure that there's enough every day and, and they basically sell out. And so uh, it uh, has dried raspberries for spikes. It's a uh, hard chocolate shell with cocoa powder, white chocolate. And then if you watch the video, uh, they, they cut through it and there's a pistachio ganache and raspberry puree. It's just wow. exquisite. It's amazing yeah. looking. And I think the little thing under it is a chocolate kind of plate, it's like a, right? Uh, it's just, there's a there's a, a wafer and then there's the spoon or the serving thing. That oh, the spoon is on. not made of chocolate. It's actually a spoon, I, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, it I looks think great. Could you eat that whole thing, spoon. Kathy? Oh, easily, yeah. <laughs> Especially since it's not cake. When I thought it was cake, I'm not a cake fan, but this I could do. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. I'd take one of those. Yeah, <laughs> I would. If you weren't hungry before, you are now. Uh, and the second one is from our friend Mary in Washington, who uh, uh, pointed us to the New York Times story about uh, drive-in singing opportunities. Uh, uh, some people in Virginia started doing this, and then there's a couple in Massachusetts who've put this all this equipment together and people can sing together in real time with near zero latency from their cars so they would <laughs> for instance drive into a church parking lot tune into a special fm radio frequency that they're told about they get microphones handed to them and then they can sing together in real time and so um, i know of some churches and other choral groups that are actually buying this equipment so they can do this uh, for themselves. So 
it's just a cool story for the music singing arc. Boy, you gotta nice. really want to do it to go through nice. all of this. This is amazing. Well, if you're one of the participants, you just show up and get a microphone and oh, a sheet okay. music. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, did this ever to happen to any of you? I have a one o'clock appointment on my calendar. I have no idea who it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it has no. happened. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. It says, Matthew, yeah. I looked in my email and I have no idea. I should have put some more information. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> anyway, that's TWIV672. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us emails to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brianne Barker is at Drew University on Twitter, bioprof. Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Great to be with all of you, and it was a great show. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>